Hi there, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. It's been a while, right? Yeah, uh, my bad. <laughs> my kids have been sick, and Mama has been busy. So they've been having to stay home, so if you hear barking in the background or something, just disregard it. Anyway, it's been too long, and I need to put this episode out already. Today I'm going to tell you guys all about Marilyn Monroe. And I'm really excited for this one because I'll be honest with you, I didn't know a lot about this case before I started researching it. There are a lot of mysteries surrounding the death of Marilyn Monroe. The official cause of death was ruled to be a suicide by overdose. But I'm going to tell you just why people don't buy that. There are a lot of conspiracy theories about what exactly killed her. You may have heard the one that says that the Kennedys had her killed as a result of her affair with JFK and his brother Robert. Others have said that the FBI or the CIA had her killed because she was exposing secrets. Okay, so let's get started. First, I need to tell you about Marilyn's mother, Gladys, because Marilyn's mother also had her fair share of trauma, and I think it speaks to the way Marilyn was raised. Gladys Pearl Monroe was born to her parents, <laughs> duh, she was born to her parents, Della and Otis Monroe. Otis died of syphilis of the brain, and not long after that, Della became kind of a, how do I put this, kind of flirty? She had a lot of male visitors, according to Gladys. Eventually, she fell in love with an oil driller named Charles, but Charles didn't want her to move in with him because she had children. So she pushed her 14-year-old daughter, Gladys, into a relationship with a 26-year-old man named Jasper Baker. Gladys and Jasper had two kids together, a son they called Jackie and a daughter named Bernice. But Jasper was a drunk, abusive husband. There was one occasion where, I guess, Gladys went out on a hike with Jasper's brother. And when she got home, Jasper beat the shit out of her. Gladys filed for divorce, and she won custody of the kids. But Jasper actually took them, he kidnapped the kids, and he moved them out to Kentucky. Gladys spent a good portion of six months trying to find them, but eventually she just gave up. She left the kids in Kentucky with them, and she got a job working as a film cutter for Hollywood. Marilyn didn't actually know about her siblings for a while, and she met her sister Bernice for the first time when she was like 12 years old. In 1924, Gladys remarried to a guy named Martin Edward Mortensen, but they separated shortly after the marriage. She then started seeing a guy named Charles Stanley Gifford, and she became pregnant. She told him on New Year's Eve, hoping that, you know, like the holiday spirit would get him excited and that he might propose, but he did not. He was newly divorced, and he was digging the freedom, so he offered her some money, which she refused. So he was like, well, fortunately, you're not actually divorced yet, so you can give this baby your husband's last name. So Gladys named her baby Norma Jean Mortensen. Gladys and Martin would get divorced shortly after Norma Jean's birth, and Gladys's mother, Della, gave her a lot of shit for having a child out of wedlock. It was super frowned upon in this time period, like unspeakable. It was said during these times that a child born out of wedlock was like, born with a stain on them. So when they baptized Norma Jean, they did so under the name Norma Jean Baker. Mental illness ran in their family. It goes back all the way to Della, at least. When Norma Jean was just 12 days old, Della suggested that Gladys give her to this nice couple across the street, the Bolanders. The Bolanders were a pair of foster parents, but since Norma Jean wasn't technically a foster child, Gladys would pay them the $5 a week that the state would normally pay them if she were a foster child. On one occasion, when Norma Jean was like one or two years old, Della walked across the street to the Bolander home and used her elbow to break a window to get into their house, and she demanded to see Norma Jean, saying that Norma Jean had died and they were refusing to tell her or Gladys. Ida Bolander, the foster mother, like, didn't know what to do, so she tried to calm her down, and she showed her the sleeping baby. At some point, Ida walked away to try to get Della a glass of water, and Della actually tried to smother Norma Jean with a pillow. Ida caught her and became frantic. 
She grabbed the baby, and Della said that she was just adjusting the pillows. The police came, and it was such a scene that they decided to just take Della home and do nothing else about it. Shortly after that, though, she would start to hallucinate and have episodes and ended up at a hospital, and she died only about a month later at just 51 years old. Gladys ended up pretty much completely alone. She had lost all of her kids and her mother. Her best friend Grace said that she didn't hear from her for like a year or two after Della died. When Norma Jean was about three years old, Gladys decided that she was just going to go and take Norma Jean back. I guess her intention was always to get Norma Jean back one day, but she just like showed up at the Bolander's house one day all frantic and demanded to take her home with her. Mind you, Norma Jean has like no idea who she is at this point. And Ida tries to sit her down to talk to her and tell her like, this is her home. We want to adopt her. Well, at some point, Gladys managed to push Ida out the back door and lock her out. So Ida's like freaking out at this point, not knowing what she's going to do. So she ran around the house and like back in through the front door, but she didn't see them. So she ran back outside and she looked around and she didn't see them. So she's like starting to cry at this point when suddenly Gladys comes out through the front door carrying a duffel bag with Norma Jean stuffed inside of it. Ida managed to grab the bag and they kind of like wrestled over it for a bit before Norma Jean just like fell out of the bag and ran over to Ida. They both ran inside and they locked the doors and Gladys like circled the house and tried to open the doors and the windows for a little bit until Ida was finally like, okay, I called the police, I'll be here any minute. And Gladys finally left. Norma Jean stayed with the Bolanders until she was about seven years old. Gladys convinced Ida that her episode that day was just because she forgot to take her pills. Ida felt guilty and she tried and tried to get her to let them adopt her, but Gladys refused. Gladys got a little place of her own with her friend Grace and they would sometimes bring Norma Jean over for sleepovers. But Norma Jean barely knew who she was and she was pretty afraid of her and it was said that she would spend a lot of her time hiding in the closet. When Gladys eventually took her home to live with her, Norma Jean knew who she was, obviously, but she didn't really know her well, and she didn't feel like a mother. One day, Gladys had an episode where she, like, threw herself down the stairs and started freaking out about somebody coming down the stairs and trying to kill her. She apparently grabbed a knife at one point and threatened to stab Grace. Then she got news that her son, who had been kidnapped when he was an infant, had died of kidney failure. She broke down and actually said to Norma Jean, why couldn't it have been you? Just a couple weeks after that, Gladys had gotten news that her grandfather had hanged himself and died. She broke down and was eventually taken to a mental hospital and diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Grace became Norma Jean's legal guardian, but she ended up marrying a guy named Doc Goddard who had his own kids and didn't really want anything to do with Norma Jean. So at first, Grace, being a married woman, decided that this was a great time for her to take Norma Jean in. But less than a month after she moved in with them, Doc Goddard started sexually abusing her. So Grace took her to an orphanage. Which is just awful at this point. I mean, Norma Jean is like nine years old and her mom is still alive. And she just doesn't understand why Grace is getting rid of her. And she just keeps crying, but I'm not an orphan. As you can imagine, she was probably already feeling pretty alone and unwanted by this point. She actually developed a stutter as a child, and it was said that as an adult, when she would get nervous, it would kind of come back. Throughout her childhood, Norma Jean lived in multiple foster homes, and she was sexually abused or raped on multiple occasions. In one instance, there was a man from her foster home who told her to come into his room and when she went in, he locked the door and said, now you can't get out. And then the man raped her. When she went and told her foster mother about it, she told her, don't you dare say such things about that nice man. He's my best tenant. And she smacked her across the face. Marilyn actually spoke about this publicly as an adult. In fact, she's known as one of the first celebrities to speak out about sexual abuse. By the time Marilyn was about 15, she was living with Grace and her husband Doc again, but Doc got a job out of state and the law prohibited them from taking Marilyn with them. 
She was faced with having to go back to an orphanage, but there was one thing that she could do to get out of going back, according to Grace. She could get married. The problem was she was only 15, so who was going to marry her? Fortunately, I I don't know for who, in Grace's head, fortunately, their next-door neighbor had a handsome 20-year-old son. So Grace literally went next door and asked her neighbor, hey, do you think your son can marry Norma Jean so she doesn't have to go back to an orphanage? His name was Jim Doggerty. So they went on a couple dates, and then they got married when Marilyn was 16 and Jim was 21. They moved to Catalina Island, and they were happy for a while, except she wasn't really interested in having sex with Jim. Jim was a merchant marine, so while he was shipped out, Marilyn took a job at a factory making airplane parts. A photographer named David Conover went to the factory to photograph beautiful women who were assisting with the war efforts as a way to cheer up the brave men on the front. So, of course, beautiful Norma Jean, who was 18 at this time, was chosen to be photographed. Conover told her that she was a natural model. He said, you could do this professionally. And that was pretty much all she needed to hear. She quit her job, against the wishes of her husband, by the way, and she signed a contract with the model agency. She dyed her hair bleach blonde and threw herself into her work. She was said to be an incredibly hard worker. She was really broke for a while, and she spent the little money she had on speech lessons, so she used to wander around practicing her speech. I want to read a little passage from her memoir. It says, The lessons are a dollar apiece. For a dollar, you could buy a pair of stockings and a hamburger sandwich. But stockings and a hamburger will never make you an actress. Speech lessons may. So with bare legs and an empty stomach, you hit the consonants of Hail to Thee, Fly Spirit. One day, Marilyn tried to cash a check from one of her jobs, and she stopped and asked a police officer for directions to a bank. The officer was, like, super friendly, and he walked her to a bank. That night around midnight, Norma Jean was sleeping in her bed when she heard someone cutting the screen of her window. She jumped out of bed, and she saw this random man climbing into her bedroom window, so she ran out to a neighbor's house to call the police. When the police got there, they looked around, and they didn't find the prowler. So they told her that she probably had nothing to worry about because an offender is never going to hit the same house twice in one night. And just as they were saying that, somebody knocked on the door, which was weird because it's like 1 a.m. at this point, and Marilyn said she wasn't expecting anyone. So she answered the door, and it was the same guy who was trying to climb through her bedroom window. He lunged at Marilyn and grabbed her, and this is when the police officer stepped in. The man said something like, Oh, we're old friends. Tell him, Marilyn. And the cops were actually like, well, he knows your name and address, so it seems like you're friends with this guy. Fortunately, they decided to frisk the guy before letting him go, and they found a gun on him. And upon looking closer, they saw that this gun was actually a police gun. The prowler was actually the police officer that had helped her cash her check that day. He had actually been watching her cash her check, and he took down her name and address. It turns out that the police department convinced Marilyn not to press charges because that officer was a new officer and he had a wife and a kid and it would just give the police department a black eye. Marilyn struggled to get work for a while. One of the first auditions that she was offered was a big disaster. A man named Mr. Sylvester called her for an audition and offered to pick her up. They went to a studio and the door had the name Dugan on it and Mr. Sylvester was like, Odugan and I share an office for audition purposes. So he had her sit on a couch and read from a script, and as she's reading it, he repeatedly asked her to hike up her skirt higher and higher. Until, eventually, he actually climbed onto the couch with her and started groping her. So she socked him in the eye and jumped up and kicked him, and then she ran away. It turns out that this Mr. Sylvester guy wasn't a real Hollywood anybody. He literally broke into this Dugan guy's office to molest Marilyn. Because at this point, she's not really well known, but she was an actress who was putting her name out there looking for jobs. Marilyn started getting more and more work as a model. Within six months, she had appeared in at least 33 magazine covers. She truly was a natural. She was said to have had, like, a magical quality that translated in photographs unlike any other model. 
she decided that she wanted to get into acting. So she signed a contract with 20th Century Fox, and she had a couple small roles, but she was eventually dropped from her contract. Apparently, they just didn't feel that she was catching on. So then she signed a six-month contract with Columbia Pictures, and she starred in a B-list movie called The Ladies of the Chorus, but they didn't renew her contract either. So it wasn't easy for her to get her foot in the door of the acting world. Marilyn didn't exactly mind sleeping her way to the top, though. Hollywood was a very male-dominated industry, so a lot of the young struggling actresses of the time had fallen victim to the casting couch. Apparently, these Hollywood executives would have these, like, little parties where they would, like, play poker and drink and smoke cigars and shit. And they would invite these aspiring actresses and have them, like, fill everybody's glasses and shit, and they called them party girls. And then whenever the dude saw a girl that they liked, they would offer her the moon and the stars. They would offer her a contract or a screen test, and they would say that this could be their ticket to stardom. But more often than not, it wasn't. It seems like Marilyn was down to use her sex appeal to her advantage, but she was also prepared to draw the line when she had to. She always said that she never would sleep with somebody she didn't actually like. For example... Harry Cohn, who was the head of Columbia Pictures, he made a pass at her. He invited her to his yacht over the weekend, but she thought he was sleazy. So she was like, oh, I'd love to come on your yacht, Mr. Cohn, and I'm so looking forward to meeting your wife. Dude was pissed, because of course his wife was not invited on the trip. In fact, Henry Cohn was actually one of the people who dropped her from Columbia, all because she wouldn't put out. In 1946, she divorced Jim Dougherty, who was against her having a career in Hollywood. It just didn't work out. Norma Jean was a model now, and she adopted the name Marilyn Monroe. Jim said it was like she was becoming this whole new person, which she was, and I think Jim just wasn't right for her anymore at that point. Marilyn started getting small roles here and there, but she was slowly getting noticed. She had a little affair with Joe Skink, although she always said their relationship was platonic. He was an executive at 20th Century Fox and about 20 years her senior, and he was apparently head over heels for her. He tried to get her connections, but he wasn't really helpful in her career. Not like Johnny Hyde, anyway. Johnny Hyde was the vice president of the William Morris Agency, which was the top talent agency in Hollywood at this time, and he was super influential in Hollywood. He instantly fell in love with Marilyn, and he got her a seven-year contract with Fox and small roles in multiple films. She became Johnny's protege and his lover, despite him being married. Johnny truly worked hard for Marilyn's career. He was incredibly devoted to her. He even left his wife and kids for her, and he genuinely believed in her ability to become a star. Johnny got her two big roles. One was in All About Eve, which was an all-star cast. The other was in The Asphalt Jungle. They were both small parts, but everybody remembered her. Both films also bagged a few Academy Awards, so Marilyn started getting all this fan mail, and the studios took notice and started getting her bigger roles. Sadly, just a few days after Marilyn signed her contract with Fox, Johnny Hyde died of a heart attack. Marilyn was devastated. But the work he had put into Marilyn's career was paying off and everyone was beginning to see what he saw in her. After that, pretty much every role she did was a major role. She became, like, way more famous than even she could have imagined. In fact, I don't know if many other people in history have ever been as famous as Marilyn Monroe was at that time. Over the next two years, Marilyn worked in at least ten films. She was named the It Girl of the Year in 1952, and she had a reputation as the sexiest up-and-coming actress in Hollywood. In 1952, Marilyn started dating baseball player Joe DiMaggio. They were set up on a date, and Marilyn was expecting him to be, like, this flashy sports star. But when he got there, he was actually kind of quiet and sensitive. They totally hit it off, and they became, like, the royal couple. They were both super attractive, and everybody loved them both. And they were very, very in love with each other. In 1953, Marilyn starred in three classics that helped her rise beyond the rest. Niagara, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and How to Marry a Millionaire. Even though Marilyn was dating Joe DiMaggio, 
Rumors were going around saying that Marilyn was having love affairs with pretty much every eligible hot male actor and some not so eligible ones. Joe really, really loved Marilyn, but he was also very possessive. Like, when she was filming The Seven Year Itch, he insisted on coming onto the set with her. That's the movie with the infamous scene where she's like wearing a white dress and standing over this like manhole cover and her dress is like blowing around and all these guys were whistling at her. Well, Joe was livid and he called her a whore and beat the shit out of her when they got home, saying that she humiliated him in front of the whole world. He essentially wanted her to drop her career and become his housewife, not this sex symbol. Marilyn would end up leaving Joe DiMaggio only nine months into their marriage. He never stopped loving her, though. It was said that he had spent $10,000 on a sex doll that looked exactly like Marilyn Monroe, which he called Marilyn the Magnificent. This was confirmed by multiple sources, because Joe would, like, show it to everybody, and he would say she can do everything the real Marilyn can do, except talk. So like I said, Marilyn got way more famous than even she could ever imagine being, and her being so in the spotlight was starting to affect her nerves. She became kind of a perfectionist, and she was said to ask for another take over and over again until she felt like it was perfect. See, I think we all worry about how we look, but Marilyn literally had the entire world looking at her. She had to be perfect and beautiful at all times, and people were waiting for her to fuck up. With all this pressure, she fell into this cycle of drugs. Back in this day, it was really common for Hollywood executives to hand out pet pills to the actors. This would be like amphetamines to give them lots of energy, or sometimes to help them lose weight. Then they would be so wired at the end of the day that they had to take sleeping pills. Again, this was super common in Hollywood. Julie Garland was also a victim of this vicious drug cycle, and she actually died of an accidental overdose. But that's a conversation for another day. So Marilyn, like many other entertainers, became dependent on barbiturates, amphetamines, and alcohol. In 1956, Marilyn married the famous playwright Arthur Miller. With the marriage, she converted to Judaism. As a result, all of her films were banned in Egypt until 1961 after she divorced Arthur Miller. While she was married to Arthur Miller, her drug use was getting worse. She was in the habit of washing down her pills with champagne, and she actually overdosed in 1957. Arthur called paramedics, and they were able to save her. She also suffered multiple miscarriages around this time, and she put a lot of blame on herself, thinking that it was possible that she killed her baby because of her drug use. But she also had endometriosis, and she actually got a procedure done to see if she could have children and it was determined that it would never be possible for her to have children. This put her in a really deep depression. Arthur wrote a movie specifically with Marilyn in mind called The Misfits, where Marilyn would play alongside Clark Gable. On November 4th, 1960, Clark Gable had a heart attack. Marilyn saw Clark as a father figure. When she was a little kid in the orphanage, she would keep a picture of him and pretend that he was her father. On November 16th, Clark Gable died. Marilyn and Arthur also separated around this time. Marilyn fell deeper and deeper into her depression, and she was reportedly suicidal during this time. By this point, Marilyn was seeing a psychiatrist named Marianne Chris. Marilyn told Dr. Chris that she got really drunk one night and looked out her apartment window, and she thought about jumping. She said that she would have jumped, but she looked down and she saw a woman she recognized walking on the sidewalk, and she didn't want to hurl her body at her or right in front of her and just splat all over her. Of course, Dr. Chris was worried that Marilyn was going to try to kill herself, so she convinced her to sign herself into a clinic in New York City. But it wasn't what Marilyn was expecting at all. Marilyn had been inside of clinics and hospitals before, so she thought she was going to have like a fancy rest in a clinic. But instead, she was taken to the Payne Whitney Psychiatric Hospital where she was locked in a padded cell and left alone. She spent her time there banging on the door, bruising herself in the process. I guess they wouldn't let her call anyone, but eventually she got a call out to Joe DiMaggio, and he came and got her after four days. Or, I'm sorry, she was in there for four days before she was able to call him, and then he immediately came. And they didn't want to let her out at first, but he was, like, 
I'm going to give you five minutes to bring me my wife or I'm going to tear this place down brick by brick. So after she got out, she went back to California and started seeing the psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson. Dr. Greenson crossed a few lines with Marilyn. For one, they started sleeping together. Dr. Greenson fell in love with her, and he was, like, making all sorts of decisions for her, like, about who she should be hanging out with and who her friends should be. He was also, like, prescribing her medications, and it just... Marilyn needed, like, a father figure. She was, like, always searching for one, and he was said to have kind of been one. So this whole relationship was just not appropriate. Okay, so let's talk about JFK for a minute. Pretty much the one thing that everybody has collectively heard is that Marilyn and John F. Kennedy had an affair. How many times they actually slept together is debatable. From what I can gather, a lot of sources actually believe they didn't have a relationship so much as they slept together, like, once. But others will argue that they had a secret affair for like two years or so. Some believe that Marilyn was completely in love with John F. Kennedy, while others say that she had no interest in having anything more than a fling with him. John F. Kennedy was known to sleep around on his wife, though. Some would even say that he had like a sexual addiction. I read in one source that the staff would make jokes like, oh, John's going to have his aspirin, but aspirin was really a code for a prostitute. (laughs) So Marilyn was friends with John F. Kennedy's sister, Patricia, who was married to an actor named Peter Lawford. Peter Lawford was also in the Rat Pack, so he was one of Frank Sinatra's buddies. So Marilyn and John hooked up at a party at Bing Crosby's house in March of 1962, It's believed that it was at this party that John actually asked Marilyn to sing happy birthday for him at his celebration in Madison Square Garden. At some point, Marilyn started a relationship with John's brother, Robert, also known as Bobby Kennedy. Some sources say that Marilyn was like blowing John's phone up, trying to see him again, and he decided to just kind of pawn her off on his brother, Bobby. I guess it was also pretty common for John and Bobby to share girls like that. Ew. Marilyn hooked up with Bobby, and again, many people believe that she was head over heels in love with him, and she expected him to leave his wife for her. Pat Lawford, the sister of the Kennedys and Marilyn's friend, tried to knock some sense into her and explain that Bobby makes these promises to women, but he's never actually going to leave his wife. In May 1962, John F. Kennedy had his big birthday celebration, where Marilyn sang happy birthday in a breathy voice, and she wore a tan dress with rhinestones, making her look like she was nude. This was literally like one thin piece of fabric with 2,500 crystals sewn across it. It was glamorous. Literally looked like she was wearing nothing but diamonds. She actually got in a lot of trouble at work, though, because... She was actually in the middle of filming the movie Something's Gotta Give, and she had been calling out sick for weeks. And then she went and sang happy birthday to the president, and of course, everybody in the whole world saw it. When Marilyn did show up for work, she was always late or difficult to work with, so they ended up firing her, and they sued her for $750,000 in damages. They tried to recast her, but her co-star, Deed Martin, refused to do the film without her. So they sued him too. That movie never came out. Everything was basically abandoned after Marilyn died. Okay, now let's talk about the night in question, and then we can talk about the theories and the possibilities of what happened. So the night in question is August 4th, 1962. And let me preface this by saying that there is an official version of events, and then there's the true version, according to the witnesses who would speak up later. So... Let's talk about the official timeline first. Marilyn spent the day at her home in California, and at about 4.30 p.m., she called her psychiatrist, Dr. Greenson, to come visit her for a psychoanalysis session. He stayed until about 7 p.m., and before he left, he asked Marilyn's maid, Eunice Murray, to stay the night and keep Marilyn company. After he left, she talked on the phone to a few people, including Joe DiMaggio's son, and then she talked to Dr. Greenson on the phone neither of which said that there was anything alarming about her behavior during the calls. At about 8 p.m., Marilyn went to bed and she got a call from Peter Lawford, allegedly. So Peter allegedly called Marilyn and tried to get her to come out to go to a party at his house. He said that she sounded intoxicated and her, her speech was slurred, and she said to him, Say goodbye to Pat, 
say goodbye to the president, and say goodbye to yourself because you're a nice guy. This phrase, this quote, is one of the main reasons people believe that she killed herself. Peter was concerned, so he tried calling Dr. Greenson but couldn't reach him. He finally reached one of Marilyn's lawyers who called the house and spoke to the maid, Eunice, who was like, I mean, as far as I know, everything's fine. But she didn't actually get up and check or anything. Around midnight, Eunice got up to go to the bathroom, and for some reason, she got a feeling that something was wrong with Marilyn. She claims that she could see under the door that Marilyn's light was still on. However, this couldn't have been true because Marilyn had just gotten really thick carpet installed, and it wasn't actually possible to see any light under the door. Not only that, but Eunice actually had a bathroom in her bedroom, meaning she wouldn't have had to go anywhere near Marilyn's room to get to the bathroom. Eunice is pretty inconsistent, because uh, I guess she also knocked and tried to open the door, but it was locked and Marilyn didn't answer. But later on, Eunice would actually say that the door actually didn't have a lock. So, I guess Eunice called Dr. Greenson and told him that something was wrong. He allegedly looked through a window and saw Marilyn face down and naked, so he punched through the window to let himself in. He found her cold and blue. She was clearly dead. So then he called Marilyn's physician, Dr. Engelberg, who came and said, yep, she's dead. What's strange is they didn't call 911 until about 4 a.m. So Eunice Greenson and Engelberg, who had all originally said that they found Marilyn dead around midnight, all changed their stories later, saying that they actually found her around 3.30 in the morning instead, therefore eliminating that four-hour gap. So at like 4.30 in the morning, Officer Clemens showed up. He was the first detective to come and take a look around the house. The first thing he notices when he gets there is that Eunice was doing laundry at 4 in the morning, which was fucking weird. The next thing he noticed was Marilyn's body looked almost as if it were posed. This looked like it was staged. The next thing he noticed was, okay, well, there's all these empty pill bottles here, and the they're completely empty. The lids were placed perfectly on the pill bottles. And there was seemingly no glass of water or any kind of liquid for her to have drank all those pills, which was weird because she would have taken at least like 40 pills. So again, that's possible. It's just kind of strange. And then again, there was that weird four hour time gap that didn't make any sense. Officer Clemens was the one who initially questioned Eunice, Dr. Greenson, and Dr. Engelberg, and he was like, what were you guys doing for those four hours? And they were just like, talking. <laughs> like, it didn't make any sense. They were just like hanging out with her dead body. And they claimed initially that they had to like call the producers of the movie she was in to like get the okay to call the police, which doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why the movie producers wouldn't want them to call 911 if her lifeless body is there but anyway after they talked to officer clemens that was when their story changed and they were like oh no it hasn't been four hours see we just found her at three in the morning actually okay so before i go any further let me um fill in this timeline a little bit with things we found out after the fact so on the day of august 4th according to the kennedys bobby was with the kennedys in san francisco However, at least 18 witnesses would actually see Bobby Kennedy in Los Angeles or specifically in Marilyn's home. Early in the afternoon of August 4th, Bobby Kennedy and Peter Lawford went over to Marilyn's house. Bobby actually tried to break things off with Marilyn and told her that too many people were watching them closely, like J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. Marilyn was livid, and she made all kinds of threats about exposing their relationship and exposing the relationship she had with John and exposing all the secrets that they had told her or she had overheard, and then she screamed at him to get out of her house. See, allegedly, Marilyn had all kinds of secrets that she would write down in her little red diary. Some of the secrets included that well, for one example, John F. Kennedy supposedly told her that the CIA was planning on killing Fidel Castro. So at this point, she's pissed off because he's breaking up with her, and she's threatening to expose all this shit in a press conference. So she screamed at him to get out of her house, and Peter and Bobby left that afternoon at about 2.30 p.m. But 
supposedly Bobby was seen coming back at 9.45 that evening by a neighbor and her three friends who were playing bridge. Around the time that he was supposedly spotted, Marilyn was actually on the phone with actor Jose Bolaños. He recalls that she heard a noise coming from her guest cottage and she said that she was going to go check it out and be right back. However, she never came back on the line. Well, Marilyn's house had actually been bugged by the CIA and the Kennedys and possibly by Joe DiMaggio's jealous ass too. So supposedly there were these tapes that existed where you could hear everything that happened that night, but they have since been destroyed. But those who have heard it have said that at this point in the tapes, you can hear some kind of scuffle between Marilyn and Bobby and that Bobby and two aides were looking for Marilyn's red diary in the guest house. Allegedly, Marilyn can be heard on the tape saying, I'm tired of being used, and the things I know could make the headlines. And then Bobby replying, you'd better keep your mouth shut if you know what's good for you. Then Marilyn is said to have become hysterical, and Bobby can be heard saying, give her something to calm her down. And supposedly, you can hear them smothering her and someone saying, be careful with the pillow, and watch out for the shot. Then Marilyn is apparently sedated and you can hear the men frantically rummaging through her house and looking for the diary. By 10.30 p.m. they come up empty. Those who support this account believe that Bobby and the two men left the house without the diary and that they left Marilyn there unconscious but still alive. Around 10.35 Marilyn's maid Eunice Murray came home with the handyman and found Marilyn unconscious. They then called an ambulance as well as Dr. Greenson. The ambulance crew got there first. One of the ambulance attendants was named James Hall, and he says that he found Marilyn still alive and tried to resuscitate her. James actually didn't see a copy of the death report until 1982, and at that point, he realized that what had been documented didn't add up to his recollection of the events. So James, I guess, intubated Marilyn, and color started coming back into her face. She was starting to come back. And just as she was coming around, Dr. Greenson showed up and started taking over. He instantly announced that they needed to stop the resuscitation, and he pulled out a gigantic hypodermic syringe that was like nothing any normal doctor or psychiatrist would just be carrying around in their bag. According to James, that's when three more people arrived. Peter Lawford, Pat Newcomb, who was Marilyn's publicist, and Marvin Ianone, a detective who had worked closely with Bobby in the past. James assumed that this giant heart needle was going to, like, have an adrenaline shot or something to revive her, but what really concerned him was the manner in which it was administered. Here's a clip of James explaining what he saw. He took a pharmaceutical bottle out of his doctor's bag that's kind of a little rubber stopper on the top and filled the syringe from that, and he counted down the rib cage, pushed her breast to the side, and stuck the needle into her chest. Although he did it wrong, it was at an angle, and the needle stopped. Instead of backing it out and starting over, he just leaned on it, and it went snap, and it broke her rib. He just shoved it right into her heart. Interestingly, James was the only person in this case to take a polygraph test. And I know that polygraph tests aren't admissible or conclusive, but what's interesting is that James actually took 14 fucking polygraph tests and passed every single one. It's just interesting considering not a single other person seems to be telling the truth here. And also, I, I don't see why he would lie. But, of all the people present when this allegedly happened, three of which eventually confirmed that Greenson was present when Marilyn died. Of course, the first being James, the second being the ambulance driver, and the third being Peter Lawford. Peter actually admitted later that he heard Bobby call Dr. Greenson and tell him that Marilyn was going to expose her relationship with him as well. So Dr. Greenson was therefore worried that he was going to lose his medical license. Supposedly, Bobby then convinced him that she had to be taken care of. I found another more in-depth account from Peter. This was from an interview he did with a retired detective named Officer Rothschild. So Peter Lawford says that he picked Bobby Kennedy up from the airport and took him to Marilyn's house. 
almost immediately, things got heated. Marilyn accused Bobby of treating her like a whore. Supposedly, according to Peter, Bobby slammed her to the ground and started shouting at her and told her to shut her mouth. She got up and slapped him, at which point Bobby got pissed and Peter thought he was going to hit her, so he pulled him back. Then Bobby stormed off and started rummaging through Marilyn's shit looking for her diary where she wrote about all her relationships and the secrets that she had heard. Later on, Peter allegedly saw Bobby giving Marilyn a glass and telling her to drink it. She mentioned that it tasted weird and he told her, finish it, hurry up. Bobby and Peter kept looking for the diary, and when they came back in the room, they found Marilyn on the sofa, kind of leaning, and she was unintelligible, and she didn't seem to be breathing. Bobby allegedly grabbed Peter's arm and said, leave her. Then two guys, who Peter presumes were from the CIA, showed up, and Bobby ordered Peter to drive him to the airport, while these guys covered up and made it look like a suicide. Interestingly, a few weeks after Peter admitted this story, Officer Rothschild was attacked in what he called a mob-style assassination. He was driving in an unmarked car and someone on a motorcycle just pulled up next to him and shot at him. He survived just barely. He had some pretty extensive injuries, but he did not die. Peter Lawford died two years later of cardiac arrest. So like I said, the police were called by Dr. Engelberg at about 4 a.m. on August 5th, 1962. Again, Officer Clemens showed up. He questioned them, was like, why did it take you four hours? They changed their story. They looked for the glass. They found no glass. It was all really weird. Oddly enough, when the police officers started showing up to take the photographs, there was suddenly a glass of water out in plain sight. It was in the police photos and everything, but Officer Clemens is sure that that was placed after he analyzed the scene because he looked everywhere and there was no sign of a glass of water anywhere. After an hour at the crime scene, more LAPD officers started showing up and Clemens was replaced by none other than Marvin Ianone, Bobby's buddy and go-to security man in Los Angeles. Just a few hours after dying, Marilyn's death was ruled a probable suicide. Eunice Murray, the maid, supposedly found the red diary and gave it to the coroner's office. The deputy coroner's aide says that the diary was handed to him directly and he placed it in a locked safe overnight, but the next day it was gone. When medical examiner Thomas Noguchi requested toxicology tests on the body, he was told that Marilyn's organs had been disposed of. So her organs are missing now. Then the tapes, they apparently all went missing as well. Sadly, when Marilyn died, nobody claimed her body. She didn't actually have any family at this point. Eventually, Joe DiMaggio claimed her body and he made all the funeral arrangements. He actually sent flowers to her grave twice a week for the next 20 years. Okay, now let's talk about the theories and the possibilities. So first, we have to discuss the possibility that Marilyn did indeed commit suicide. For one, there's a lot of strange circumstances surrounding her death that don't make it look like a suicide so much, like the missing glass of water. And we have to wonder whether or not Marilyn was truly suicidal. So we know she was suicidal once in her life, not long before she died. People were claiming that Marilyn was getting more and more depressed because she didn't have any jobs. She was no longer in good standing with Fox. She had lost the movie. She had been sued. However... The movie that she had gotten sued over, Something's Gotta Give, Marilyn actually got hired back onto that job before she died. She had also just signed contracts to work in two new movies. So her career wasn't necessarily in shambles so much like everybody believed. Marilyn had actually written letters to her acting coach saying that this was the happiest time of her life. So it seems that Marilyn was actually planning kind of a comeback. Then there is the theory that, of course, Bobby Kennedy killed her or had Dr. Greenson kill her. But there's one more theory I haven't talked about yet, and that is that the mob actually killed Marilyn. And there's a couple of motives to support this theory. So after Marilyn divorced from Arthur Miller, she started dating Frank Sinatra for a little bit. She also started dating this guy named Sam Giancana at one point, who was a mob boss. Now, supposedly the weekend before Marilyn's death, She was hanging out with Sam Giancana at the Calneva Lodge with Frank Sinatra. Now, there's a lot of versions of this story, but from my understanding, Marilyn got really, really drunk, really fucked up, 
and the guys all kind of passed her around. It was said that at one point, Sam Giancana was actually, like, riding her like a horse. And supposedly Marilyn loved him. She was dating him. So this is all really fucked up. And the reason behind this is kind of confusing. See, one story is that Bobby Kennedy asked Sam Giancana to silence Marilyn. The Kennedys allegedly had ties with the mob, and supposedly the mob actually helped John F. Kennedy win his presidency. So one theory is that the Kennedys went and asked Sam Giancana for this favor. Another story is actually that the mob was not a fan of the Kennedys. The story goes that John F. Kennedy gave Bobby and the government to go ahead to come after the mob. So they were trying to get back at her. There's also a story that goes the mob was trying to catch Marilyn in an affair with the Kennedy. So they invited all of them to the lodge to try to catch him in the act and get evidence of it. However, the Kennedys didn't show up. Now, if you were to ask Sam Giancana, he actually admits to killing Marilyn Monroe. And he says that the CIA told him to. Now, this could possibly be because of the supposed secrets that Marilyn may have had about the CIA. So it's interesting because at this point, we have Sam Giancana admitting to the murder. We have Peter Lawford admitting to seeing Bobby Kennedy give her some kind of drug. And then we have the ambulance driver who claims he saw Dr. Greenson inject her with something. So we've got fucking witnesses all over the place, right? Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, the autopsy and cause of death and all that. So based on the rigor mortis, it was estimated that Marilyn had actually died sometime between 8.30 p.m. and 11 p.m. She was found to have overdosed on barbiturates and was again surrounded by empty pill bottles. What's weird is they didn't find any trace of the pills in her stomach and she hadn't vomited them. So without her orally ingesting the pills, there's two possible ways she could have overdosed. The first would be if she were injected with something. The second would be if she received an enema. The enema is a weird theory. However, the reason some people do believe this is because apparently Eunice Murray was known to give Marilyn enemas for medical purposes. And this could be one reason why she would be doing laundry at four in the morning. Others believe that, again, Greenson injected something into Marilyn's chest. What's weird is that there were no puncture wounds. However, from what I've read, puncture wounds aren't always found. And in this case, Marilyn's body was found face down, meaning that blood would have pooled to the front of her body, which could make it harder to find the wound. Now, again, Officer Clemens believed that her body was posed. So it's possible that this was like a forensic countermeasure. They intentionally wanted the blood to pull to the front of their body to hide the puncture wound. What Officer Clemens believes is that she was murdered in the guest cottage on her back and was moved to her bedroom and placed face down with the phone in her hand. And there's just one more detail that I forgot to say earlier, which is that the night of Marilyn's death, at one point, a police officer pulled over a car and that car ended up having Bobby Kennedy in the back seat, and Peter Lawford was also in the car, and also Dr. Greenson. This was in Los Angeles. Peter Lawford reportedly told the police officer that he was just trying to get Bobby to his hotel before taking him to the airport. However, the hotel that he said that he was taking him to was apparently two miles back. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all the details that are pertinent to this case. I know that was a lot, but I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know this case definitely blew my mind whole. If you'd like to take a look at some photos and videos of Marilyn Monroe, just be sure to check out BrokenLimelight.com. Just for funsies, I also updated a video of Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend because, man, she really was good. Be sure to follow Broken Limelight on Facebook. Interact with me. Send me an email or something if you want to hear a particular case covered. Thanks again for your support, guys. Tell your friends. Love you.
Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box, or if you prefer to be more of a high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of its proceeds with the Cold Case Foundation, which helps with real-life cold cases. The best part is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So get started now at huntakiller.com and be sure to use code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off.